Hmm. This is a very interesting purport, so try to listen up. Mm -hmm. The Lord, as a super soul, is situated in every living being's heart. The question is, is mentioned. The Lord is situated in every living being's heart. Why then do the living entities' activities result in misfortune and misery? Okay, what's the answer? <laughs> okay, keep it for later. <laughs> the next question put forward by Vidura to Maitreya is, why are the living entities subjected to so many miseries and misfortunes in spite of the Lord's presence in their hearts as the super soul? The body is considered a fruitful tree. And the living entity and the Lord as super soul are like two birds seated in that tree. The individual soul is eating the fruit of the tree. Can somebody turn on this light? But the super soul, the Lord, is witnessing the activities of the other birds. A citizen of the state may be in miseries for want of sufficient supervision by the state authority, but how can it be possible that a citizen suffers from other citizens while the chief of the state is personally present? Hmm. Interesting. The question is being expanded. From another point of view, it is understood that the jiva, living entity, is qualitatively one with the Lord. And thus his knowledge in the pure state of life cannot be covered by nations, especially in the presence of the Supreme Lord. <coughs> How then does the living entity become subjected to ignorance and covered by the influence of maya? The Lord is the father and protector of every living entity. He is known as Bhuta Brit, or the maintainer of the living entities. Why then should the living entity be subject to so many sufferings and misfortunes? It should not be so, but actually we see that it happens everywhere. This question is therefore put forward by Vidura for solution. The answer didn't come, did it? <laughs> The question was expanded. Omagyan timidandasya ganajana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri guruvena maha shri chaitanya manobistam stapitam yena bhutale Vaya Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prastaya Bhutale Srimak Dibak Devaran Taswami Tinamini Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharini never say so soon you body pasjati a day satari ne Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadhar Sivasari Gore Bhakti Rindam. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vanchakopa, the Rupas Cha. Kripa Sindhu, Beba Cha, Patita, Nam Pavane, Vyo, Vaishnava, Vyo, Namaho, Namaha. So here is the question. Vyasa Dev answers it <coughs> in the first canto of the Bhagavatam. It's mentioned there. And it's now interesting. How is it possible with the presence of the Lord being qualitatively one with the Lord, the living entity can be and situated so closely related to the Lord? How can the living entity be accepted, subjected to so many miseries and misfortunes? Good question, huh? The answer is two things. It's not. <laughs> There's no lim the living entity does, doesn't experience misfortune or misery. The soul is aloof from everything material. 
So what is that misfortune and misery? It's illusion. <laughs> but it appears to be real. Why? What causes it to seem to be very real? Like when we are dreaming, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, tiger comes, whatever, it's real. Mm -hmm. It's real. But it's not really happening. The experience appears to be real, but the fact that it's, it's not happening, that's the dream state. But on a waking state, is it happening? It's the same rascal that causes the problem both dreaming and sleep and awake. Who's that rascal? False identification with the body. Exactly. Which comes by way of the conditioned mind. <laughs> the mind identifies and supports the egos conception that the body is the person. And therefore, we experience so-called happiness and so-called misery. But the soul doesn't touch it. We hear with the ear. We hear with, I mean, we speak with the tongue. We touch with the fingers. But are we touching? Are we hearing? Are we speaking? No. It's the body. <laughs> but because we think we're the body, and the soul connects itself with the body, thinking that I am the body. The soul is an illusion, thinking I am the body, although the, the soul doesn't experience anything that the body experiences, but it experiences the idea that I'm experiencing it. It's like you get an example, you go for an operation. They, uh, they, what do they do sometimes? They give you some anesthesia or some chloroform. And the operation is going on. And because the body has nerves, it experiences pain. But because you don't, uh, uh, you are different than the body, you're not experiencing that anymore because you're under the idea or under the conception of the anesthesia. The anesthesia is not, the body, is the body experiencing the pain anymore? No, because the anesthesia numbs the pain and makes it, makes it feel like it's not there. So we get, we believe that we suffer and we enjoy. What is that verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam? Um, uh, spoken by first canto, seventh chapter. Anybody have first canto, seventh chapter, verse number six? One, seven, six. <laughs> First canto, the seventh chapter, verse number six. Let's see if that's it. The material miseries of the living entities, which are completely unnatural, can can at once be mitigated by, connect, by the connecting process of devotional service. However, most of the people do not know it, and because of that, the learned Vyasadev compiled the Vedic literature which speaks about the Absolute Truth. Sp speak the first line again. Material miseries of the living entities, which are completely unnatural to him, can at once be... That's a different... It's, the word is superfluous. Mm -hmm. Because I'm translating on the fly, this is creation, so it's... Uh, uh, the, word, uh, the, word, the word in the Bhagavatam is superfluous. That means it's not part of the living entity's experience, although it is experiencing it. 
The word is superfluous. <laughs> Unnatural and superfluous are two different meanings, actually. Yes, now we have it in English. The material miseries of the living entity which are superfluous to him can be directly mitigated by the linking process of devotion and service. But the mass of people do not know this, and therefore the learned Yasudas compile this Vedic literature, which is in relation to the Supreme Truth. Yeah, so the material miseries seem to be miseries, but they, they have nothing to do with the living entity. They are also, they are only connected with the body, <clears throat> that's all. Because we are not the body, the miseries and the, and the happiness we also experience are not happening to us. <clears throat> Although it appears to be like that. <laughs> but because the soul identifies with the body, and therefore that identification gives that I'm experiencing happiness, I'm experiencing distress. <laughs> But the happiness and distress is material, the body is material, and the soul is spiritual. The soul never touches the material energy, although it, it thinks it does. Just like, again, the dream is a perfect analogy. When you're in the dream, you may also be suffering and enjoying in the dream. And you, the mind will be experiencing either one of the two, and you're thinking, this is happening. But actually, we understand that the person is lying there on the bed and there's nothing happening like that. A person who's awake is standing next to that person and they're seeing that person struggling in the dream and he can understand there's nothing happening, it's just a dream, that's all. So this is, Prabhupada used to say, what's the difference between the uh, night dream and the day dream? <laughs> This is a dream too. You're, you're thinking you're, you know, from Croatia. <laughs> and you're thinking you're a Mataji. <laughs> and I'm thinking I'm a, a you know, a sannyasi. <laughs> these are all illusions. <laughs> and none of these things are real because they're all part of the material energy. So on the spiritual platform, the identification with the body makes us think in a different way. But when we come back to the spiritual platform, then we identify with who we are and the activities that awaken that, and that is devotional service. So when we engage in devotional service, we actually mitigate gradually the actual sufferings and the happiness that we experience in this material body. You'll see, a brand new devotee will experience happiness and distress more so than one who is fixed in Krishna consciousness, <laughs> or is, 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 is above the three modes of material nature. They won't be bothered by material happiness and distress because they know it's, they can, they know it's just part of the material energy and it's an illusion. And even the sensations that come with these things are not even the same. So, therefore, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gora Chanda Bohole, Kotanidra, Jayo Mayam, Pisachira Gohole. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So here's the alarm clock. <laughs> wake up, wake up, you're sleeping on the mat, witch of Maya, and you're thinking that witch is devouring you. But she's not even touching you. She's devouring your consciousness, that's all. Wake up to you, to the reality, who you are, pure spirit, soul, part and parcel of Krishna. You have nothing to do with this material world. But because you're in your material body, you think you do. <laughs> that's why this place is a foreign place for the soul. The soul does not touch this material world. It's like... 
It's like if you're in a rainstorm and it's really raining out, and you decide to go for a walk or you go someplace, if you put enough, you get an umbrella and you put enough rain clothes on, your feet are covered, the rest of the body has a coat on, nice rubber raincoat, you're dry. <laughs> you don't get wet, although you're in the midst of the rainstorm. So that these coverings are our spiritual protectors, are our, our consciousness that brings us to the spiritual platform. And that is Krishna consciousness. And when we're engaged in devotional service, although we still think we touch the material energy, we don't. <laughs> the body does, the mind does. And the rascal is the mind. <laughs> That's the guy. He's the one that's given us all the trouble. <laughs> He's the one that's telling us you're suffering, you're enjoying, you're, you're who you think you are. <laughs> He's the one that's gone in, and the soul is being dragged. Now you've seen the analogy. It's a beautiful analogy, it's in the Bhagavad Gita. You see a chariot, and then you see two people sitting on the chariot, and then you see five horses. The five horses, and then you see one of the persons is holding the reins and the other one is just the passenger. So that is a beautiful analogy. The horses are the senses, the reins is the mind, the driver is the intelligent, the passenger is the soul, and the chariot is the body. So we're, and the soul is just passive. He's sitting there and the intelligence along with the mind is driving the chariot using the senses. <laughs> and the body is, and the analogy of the chariot like that. So the soul is being dragged from this place to this place thinking, ah, well, what's happening to the body is happening to me. But what's happening to the mind is happening to me. So it's hard to get away from that consciousness unless you recreate Vrindavan consciousness. You bring your mind to the spiritual realm where you enter into the realm of, of pure spiritual energy. Then your consciousness is there and all your though your body may be in this material world, you don't experience this material world anymore to whatever degree your consciousness is absorbed in the spiritual realm. So that's pure Krishna consciousness. So Vrindavan consciousness is the goal of Krishna consciousness, to bring our consciousness at the lotus feet of Krishna as he performs his activities in Sri Vrindavan Dham. You can actually, on, on the perfected stage of Krishna consciousness, you, you no longer are in this world anymore. You're with Krishna and you're participating in his activities. You might be standing there watching or you might be playing with him or you may be a gopi who's having an exchange with him. All of that can happen even while you're in this particular body when the consciousness reaches pure spiritual energy. Then you don't touch the material anymore, energy anymore. Because everything is based on consciousness. But because our consciousness is still dragged by the material consciousness, we think and we are being pulled, well, I am, yeah, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm from Croatia. None of these things have any any real definition in reality because they're just labels that we take on when we have a material body and then when we die we get a whole new material body and where are the old labels they're gone we get a whole new set of labels again we know we might not be a man in this life we might be a woman or we might be a woman in this life and a man in the next life we might be in a completely different country in this in the next life and maybe even a, even a different species, God forbid. <laughs> so everything is ephemeral in this world. It's just the world of illusion. The names, the forms, the activities are just 
a big dream state that we're experiencing. And we are, because we identify with the dream, we think I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm somewhere in between. But it's not you, it's the mind and the body. But that mind is a rascal, so we have to purify the mind. So that is the process of Krishna consciousness, bringing the mind to pure, it's back to its pure state, where it reflects the nature of the soul. It is no longer blocking the nature of the soul. Just like if you have a mirror, and if it's covered with dust, and the dust is thick, the image sitting in front of the mirror cannot be seen anymore. But as you wipe away the dust, then the image in front of the mirror is reflected perfectly in the mirror. So this does is lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and uh, what else? Envy. Mm -hmm. Envy, yeah. These are the, and also fear, we add one more too. These are the coverings that are covering the, the, the mind and the mind is simply reacting and acting based on these coverings which are coming from the material energy and is all based on desire. So what is the key? The key is to give up our desire to enjoy this material world and bring that desire to Krishna, that's all. Stop trying to enjoy this material world. When you stop trying to enjoy this material world, you will stop, you'll stop your suffering also. <laughs> because it, these things are connected. The pr principle of enjoyment is the principle of suffering. They, they cannot be separated. Every time the living entity tries to enjoy the material world, they create a form of suffering that is parallel to that mood of enjoyment. <laughs> That's how it works because you can't have one without the other. They are inseparable. That's just the nature of the material energy. And you can use many examples to see when you have, just like you want money, but your money may also cause you suffering. <laughs> you might have want a relationship with a particular person. There may be some happiness in there, but that relationship will also cause some suffering. So that's how the material energy works. But on the spiritual platform, nayan deho deho bhajan nir loke kastan kama arati vid bhujan jay tapo divyam putrakradena sadvam brahma sokyam tvanantam yusman brahma sokyam tvanantam putrakradena sadvam by performing austerities and penances, one can come to the platform of Brahma Sokyam. Sokyam means happiness, Brahman means spiritual. And what is that Bra Brahma Sokyam? Anantam. It's eternal. It doesn't diminish in, in the principle of time. It only can. So by devotional service, we experience the happiness of our own pure nature through the activities of devotional service. That is Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and every time we connect with Krishna through devotional service, we can actually experience the presence of Krishna through that activity. And when Krishna is pleased, then automatically you feel happy and satisfied. And that happiness is not material happiness. It's spiritual. <laughs> And as this verse says, that happiness is pure and it's always increasing based on that. So when we engage in devotional service, then we can gradually push back the effects of our material activities in the form of the desire to be happy, happy in this material world. <laughs> we can be happy, but not in in a material way, but in a spiritual way. And that is real happiness. And that's why in the material world there are so many formulas for happiness, but nobody's happy. <laughs> it's been going on since time immemorial. Everybody's making their plans, becoming happy. But who's happy? <laughs> nobody's happy. Everyone has to die. Everyone has to be disappointed. 
everybody has to lose whatever they gain. It's, no one's in this material world is happy. And one has to struggle so hard for something that they're going to eventually lose anyway. So this is the material world. So all of the plans that have been going on for since time immemorial has never brought the living entity any permanent happiness. Why? Because it's not there. Happiness is on the spiritual platform because it's the nature of the soul's existence. And so, therefore, when going back to the point of this verse, the living entity does not experience material happiness, nor material misery. Why? Because it's all happening to the body and the mind. That's all. The living entity, as we use that example, the chariot is being pulled, and the soul is on the chariot of the body, and the so but the soul is simply the witness. He's thinking, I'm happy, thinking, I'm sad, that's all. Because he identifies with the body, and that's the mind. The mind is the big criminal. You have to get that mind back to Krishna, that's all. But the mind is what? Chanchala. Chanchali hi mana krishna pramati balavadrita tasyaham nigaman maye vayuridam saduskaram. That mind can never be controlled, right? It's so hard to control the mind. When Krishna told Arjun, you control your mind, Arjun said, Krishna, you're asking me to control the wind. It's impossible to control the mind. It's stubborn unsteady, turbulent. But Krishna said, abhyasena tukuntaya vairagena chagriyate. Yes, Arjun, what you're saying is correct. It is very difficult to, to control the mind. But by constant practice and by detachment from everything material, one can control the mind. <laughs> he doesn't say, well, here's the way to do it. He says, practice, constant practice, and then detachment. So the mind is a very strong conditioned element. A mind can make a hell out of heaven and a heaven out of hell. You know, you, you see, we all are experiencing that sometimes. Sometimes we like something, and the next day we dislike the same thing we liked the day before. <laughs> It's simply the mind. It's just the mind's creation. Oh, I like this. Oh, now I don't like it. <laughs> the mind goes through the different, uh, what we say, uh, different aspects of uh, good happiness and distress, different opposites. It's always moving from one place and the other. I like this person. No, I don't like him. <laughs> And this is back and forth, this is the mind. And therefore, when Prahlad Maharaj was being instructed by his school, by his teachers about enemies and friends, he said, my only enemy is your own mind. That's what he said, that's the only enemy. There's no enemy outside of the mind. And, so. and the, friend, the mind can also be the best friend, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. One who controls the mind, the mind is the best of friends. One who fails to do so, their very mind becomes their worst, not enemy, but worst enemy. So this is the guy we have to work on, that rascal mind. And he makes sure he's always being guided by what? Intelligence. But if the intelligence is like the mind, then you have two thieves working to steal all your, all your treasure. What is that treasure? Your bhakti. So, but what is that? How, how do we, the, the intelligence is the guiding principle for the mind. But what guides the intelligence? Transcendental knowledge. When transcendental knowledge is applied to the intelligence, then the intelligence will guide the mind towards the spiritual energy or towards devotional service. So where does intelligence come from? Three places. From the spiritual master,
from the Shastras, from Krishna. These three places we get transcendental knowledge from and then we apply it and the application is the, the, the feature of the intelligence because intelligence is a discriminatory principle of the mind, it discriminates. And therefore applying the knowledge in the proper way and which guides the mind towards the spiritual energy. That's the key. So learn how to take this spiritual knowledge as the foundation for everything you do and apply it in an intelligent way, guiding that mind towards Krishna. That's all. And that's the secret. <laughs> that's the process. But then again, the mind is restless. So, as Krishna says, practice. <laughs> that's all. So Krishna consciousness is simply practice. Prabhupada has said that over and over. Just practice, that's all. Practice chanting, practice hearing, practice uh, performing activities and devoted practice. Everything becomes, becomes developed through the process of practice and practice in the right way. Just like if you're learning to learn, if you're learning music, you're practicing it, but if you're not practicing in the right way, you won't learn. And so a teacher is required to te te teach you how to practice that music in such a way as you get the, the benefit of your practice. So what is that teacher? The spiritual master who guides the living entity in practicing devotional service. But this practice that we do is intrinsic to our nature. So this is the key. When we practice something material, it may not be intrinsic to our nature. In other words, part of our nature. We might have to learn something. But to learn devotional service means to bring out our own nature, because our own nature is to serve Krishna. So we don't have to learn it, we have to just uncover it. But practice is the means for uncovering it. That's all. And then we can rise above all of these sufferings. And there are three sufferings. Sufferings that come from body and mind. Sufferings that come from other living entities. And sufferings that come from higher powers. Mm -hmm. Each one, the body and mind is more easier to work with. Sufferings that come from other living entities, you don't have much control over that, but you do have some control. But sufferings that come from higher powers, you have no control over. <laughs> so these are the ways that we can experience suffering. <laughs> but if we don't identify with the body, then we identify with the activities of devotional service. And gradually we reduce the effects of the so-called sufferings that we are experiencing. Adhyatmika, Adhibhautika, Adhidaivika. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop there and see if there's any questions, comments. Yes. Two questions or is that the way you raise your hand? Okay, I was thinking to ask one question, but now when you tell me like two questions, then I will ask two. Because I'm thinking to myself one or two, I think two. Uh, the first one is that uh, other tradition, hmm? not, uh, other tradition, okay. tradition, which is not uh, Krishna consciousness, it's look that they can control the mind very well. Like I don't know, in YouTube you can see Buddhist how put uh, some uh, petrol and uh, put fire and he's sitting without no any disturb. Actually, it was for, polit for political goals, some uh, uh, protest. And uh, we can see that they can control. Uh, sufferings and whatever this is the first question what this means that uh, um, how Krishna said to Arjun just practice Krishna consciousness but it looks like another tradition also can control mind and another question is what you said that um, uh, suffering would coming from mind it's uh, more easy of we don't have control for suffering was coming from earthquake we had earthquake <laughs> we cannot control that but somehow I was discussed with my guru uh, I opened him 
I opened to him my mind and said that uh, when this mental uh, suffering coming, it's so heavy. For me, it's uh, more um, heavier of the time break my leg or my hand. Yeah, whatever. It's that's so true. Heavy. Right, because we actually found statistics. People generally don't commit suicide from physical suffering, but they do from mental suffering. That's a fact. That's a statistic. Mental suffering is greater than physical suffering. <laughs> That's true. The first one about Buddhists and another uh, tradition, what they can control You're using a comparative analogy, right? That they seem to be better at controlling the mind than we are. You're using a general comparative. Mm, that may, may or may not be true. It may seem like that. But they don't do many activities. They just do prayers, meditations mostly. If you were to do the same, you also may also. But the key is that our prayers and meditations are meant to fix the mind that even when we're working, we're not working. One who sees action and inaction and inaction and action actually sees. Although we are doing so many things, we are not even doing anything. The body and mind are working. The soul is, is stanu, or what we call it, stable. It's fixed up, it doesn't move. <laughs> But the power of mind control can help one to transcend the effects of the material energy. So by the power of their mind control, they are able to accept great forms of austerity. We could also do that too, but we don't put that, that much emphasis on that. We put emphasis on preaching, we put emphasis on building temples, we put emphasis on doing things. But we have to learn how to be detached even while we're performing all of these activities that are requiring much physical and mental activity. So it's there in our tradition too, and there's devotees who are doing it. That's that required, as Krishna says, practice. When you offer the results of the activity to Krishna, then you're fixed. But if you're attached to the results of your activities, that's part of the mode of passion. We should be attached to doing it in a nice way. Just like the gopis, they offer their body to Krishna. But Krishna doesn't really care about their, their body. He's not trying to enjoy their body. But they're offering Krishna their body just to please Krishna and to show love for Krishna. And Krishna is accepting that simply to reciprocate their love. So although there's so many activities on the spiritual platform, it's, it has nothing to do with the, uh, what's happening. All it is is an exchange of love in different forms, that's all. <laughs> it's like somebody wants to give you something and uh, you may not need it, but the person is so kind and loving when they offer it to you. Just to make, just to please that person, you accept it. So what are you doing? It's the exchange between you and the person. The object is just a means, that's all. <laughs> that's bhakti. So everything we're doing is just an exchange between us and Krishna, that's all. Us and the spiritual master, that's all. The activities are just the way by which we, we connect with the person, that's all. That's why it says Krishna doesn't need anything we do, but he wants our love. <laughs>
It's love is the medium. <clears throat> so therefore, when we know that, then we try to do everything in the nicest way and offer it to Krishna, that's all. Mm-hmm. That's Krishna consciousness. If we get a million euros, we use it for Krishna. If we get 10 euros, we'll use it for Krishna. <laughs> we do the same thing. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? I can't tell whether my answer, my answers are, are being accepted or not. You're so, uh, more like a, a Buddhist. I'm fighting the English because my English is not good. That's why it's very concentrated on every word that I. Oh, okay. That's why I'm doing it. But at one point, either a light goes off or it doesn't go off. <laughs> so, are we ringing any bells or any lights going off, or is it still we're still trying to find a switch? Just karmically, like their conditioning is such that they're more able to control mind than others. Yeah, that's true. So, so as I said, it's not that this is the goal. It's not that if they're doing it for political reasons, as you mentioned, and that's I remember that and that was big for many years. Um, then it's material. That's all. And therefore, they're they're not detached. You can't be detached. You can be detached to some degree in a material sense, but not completely. Otherwise, there'd be no motivation for activity. Good. Yes. Was it Christina? Is that it? Should we be happy when we practice Krishna consciousness? Should we be? If you're not, then it's a problem. <laughs> if you're not happy, you're in Maya. <laughs> Prabhupada said that. If you're not happy, you're in Maya. <laughs> Are you happy? Sometimes. <laughs> well, you're honest. <laughs> That's good. I think most of us would answer it the same way sometimes. <laughs> But then there is spiritual distress, which is not unhappiness. It's simply the anxiety to want to improve the quality of our service. That's, I want to do, I want to do more and better service, but I'm not doing it, so therefore I'm not satisfied. <laughs> That's spiritual. But if you're thinking, hmm, I'm not happy. Uh, then it's Maya. <laughs> okay. So what, what, do, what's, what do we say? Chant and be? So you might think, well, that sounds too simplistic. <laughs> so there's a purport for that. And what's the purport? Chat and be happy means if you're looking for happiness somewhere else, you will not find the happiness in the chanting. That's the purport. So if you look for your happiness there, forget about everywhere else, and then you'll find it. <laughs> okay. Om Mani Pati Hum. <laughs> that didn't get any reaction from anybody. <laughs> Om Mani Pati Hum. You know, with that, that's Buddhas, right? Nam Yo Yo, Nam Yo Ho Grenge Kyo. 
Japanese Buddhist. <laughs> so what is ours? Ours Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Go Maha Mantra. That mantra, which is the topmost of all mantras. <laughs> Pure. Okay. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.